introduction to statistics. And uh, well, I guess you don't really have to uh, worry about this chapter. I just wanted to give you an idea of such a thing as a population, just to recap a little bit. So everything we can possibly study is called as population. And the part of population that we can actually put our hands on is called sample. That's a portion of population that we actually take and make a study on. And the sample results we utilize to make inferences about the entire population. So say that I studied about uh, 10 elements and after that, I can use these results to say that maybe everyone has that same exact result. So I guess it's better just to take a particular exercise and to do it. So we'll start with chapter two. So to get to chapter two, I have to go to page 36. Looks like that's where the chapter two starts. But if you actually put 36 in your here upper part, you see this on the very top, the pages. So right now it says two here, but what I can do is delete it and put 36, but look at where it brings me to. It actually brings me to page 24 only. So I need to add 12 to 36, so it's about 50. So if I put 50, so it's a little bit more, then I will get to the page where I should be. So that's a little bit faster way to browse through this particular textbook. So here's the chapter two, and that's where the actual statistics starts because that little introduction I talked about last time, you should not really worry about. So it starts with chapter two, section one. It's called section 2.1. And that's fine if you're a little late, as long as you're with us, that's super. So anyways, section 2.1 is a very first section of chapter two that uh, does not really have any exercises. It's called overview. So usually we don't worry about very first sections of chapters such as 2-1, 3-1, 4-1. So those sections, as you can see, if I scroll down a little bit, don't have any exercises in them. So it's just a little bit of story that brings us with some interesting, interesting information. That actually overviews entire chapter in advance. Well, our goal here will be to actually deal with section 2.2 and on that talks about another statistical word, which is called distribution. Well, in statistics, they like to name things differently. So instead of saying word table, they say it's a distribution. So it's the same thing, table distribution, it's the same thing. So you just need to realize that word distribution is something that we use in statistics to call the table. Well, so in this particular table, we have frequencies. So what does that really stand for? I think I will take a look at one little example. So we can better visualize how we can produce the so-called frequency table by just selecting a sample that they have somewhere here in the textbook. So what I'm doing is I'm scrolling down and what I'm looking for is a sample with various, various elements. So I just wanna take a look at a bunch of elements of data so we can better see how I can produce this actual distribution. So let me find some exercise that actually gives us a sample. 
because in the beginning they just give you distributions right away and that's not interesting because we don't see how they produce them so for example here i found a couple of samples so right now i'm on the page 70 and you can see it circled up there right on the page 70 for quick access there are two samples one sample is for actors and the other is for actresses well since I just need a sample. I will consider this bunch of numbers. And there will be a so-called sample of uh, size. And we can see how many elements the actual sample contains. 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 times 3 is 36 and 3 is 39. Sample size of 39 elements. Okay, whatever the sample size is, we just call it as letter N. So that's one thing that we're gonna utilize in this class for number of elements in any sample, N. So the sample will range from the smallest to the largest. So I wanna look at these numbers and notice that the smallest here Looks like it's uh, 32, is it? Do you see anything? 31. Oh, you see 31, thank you. So you have good eyes, you can see those things quickly. Thank you. So 31, do you see what's the uh, largest sample element here supposed to be? So as I found smallest 31, that's 60, oh, 76, is it? Looks like the smallest is 31 and the largest is 76. Please double check. So my sample ranges in between numbers 31 and uh, 76. So what I can do is find so-called sample range. So I can see the difference in between the largest sample element and the smallest sample element. So when I subtract from 76, number 31, largest minus smallest, looks like this is gonna be something like 45, isn't it? 45. So 45 is the width of this interval. And now what I'm gonna do is produce a bunch of classes. So I'll break my sample, well, usually with uh, four different classes. So that's a standard number of uh, classes that we have. And in order to be able to see where those classes start and where they end, I need to find so-called class width. Class width here, which is gonna be nothing else but dividing range by number of classes, which is always going to be four. I will always stick with four. So this is going to be about 11 or something. Look at this. 45 divided by four is like uh, 11 point little something, 11 and a quarter, right? I say, Alex, how can you divide this? Well, one should use a calculator to make sure that you do this correctly. So let me show you how to get a free calculator that I will utilize for all in class demonstrations. I'm gonna type scientific calculator in here, scientific calculator. And uh, first choice from all those down below the advertisements, first choice will be Desmos. And that's the scientific calculator that I will always use. So I'm going to share this with you as well. Here, I can take the link and copy it in the Zoom chat. So let me do that here. Chat and then copy this link. So I'll put it here to everyone. So you can click and you can see 
click on this link and you can see the calculator. So what I was about to do is divide 45 by four and produce 11 and a quarter. Well, it turns out that 11 and a quarter is a decimal number, right? So it doesn't look very pleasant. So what I wanna do is make it look nice. So what I can do is round it to 11 approximately, because when my width of every class is going to be equal to 11, then the numbers for the class boundaries, I can find look much nicer. So what I'm talking about is adding 11 and 31 and producing 42, right? If you add 11 to 40, 31. And then add another 11, so you're gonna get, get a 53. And then you're gonna get 64. When you say, Alex, if you add another 11, you're gonna get 75, not 76. Well, that's okay. One of the classes could be a little bit wider, usually first or last, so that's absolutely fine because usually they don't have many different elements in them anyways. So now I'm going to produce that distribution. The one, remember, we started to talk about this little table with all the classes described in it. So I'm gonna prepare the table. I'm gonna put class here. And next to it, I need to have so-called frequency. We'll see what that means right now. So let me first of all describe the classes. So it looks like first class starts at 31, right? We can see this right here. The next class at 42. The next 53, right? And finally, the last starts at 64 and ends at 76. Ends at 76. So this is our last class. So the question is, where's the previous class should end? And the answer is 63. I say, why not 64? Well, because 64 is already in the last class. So 63 should be utilized for the previous so the classes don't overlap. They don't touch each other. That's very important because when we start to see what's in class, we will know for sure what element belongs to class and which one does not. So I end this class at 52. So next is 53. So if I encounter 53, I know for sure it's in the third class, not in the second. So they have to be non overlapping. That's the idea. And the first class then will end at 41. So the next class starts at 42. So this is a little table that I'm gonna now start to fill with frequencies, with numbers of elements in each class. So what am I talking about? Well, first class runs from 31 through 41. So I'm going to underline the elements that should belong to the first class. So 31 through 41. So I'm trying to not to miss any of them. 40 also there, right? 32, this one. And uh, let's see any more. Here's 41. And then 39, 31, and 36. So how many do I have? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 elements. How about that? We call it as frequency. Number of elements in the class is called frequency. And first class has 15 elements. So now I'm going to get the second class analogously. So second class goes up to 52, right? So how many elements are there? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
14, 15 elements. That's another popular class. It also has 15 elements. Okay, whatever. I just want to make sure that I write down the number of elements in each class and put them in a table in a second column where the frequencies are. So the next class, up to 63, we have such elements as a 53, so that's one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, and that's it. So seven elements, just like that. So that's the class number three, looks like it's a little less popular as first two classes. So finally, what's left for my class number four? Looks like not much. When you say, Alex, that's 60, it should be. It should be. Yeah, 60, I have to put eight there. Yes, looks like that's the one that I have to be careful with. So thanks for uh, paying attention. So it looks like the very last class has that number 76. There is only one element in that class, right? Okay, so I put one element. And now, turns out, I can check if I did it right. What does that mean? Well, I can add all of my frequencies together and see what the total of those frequencies is going to be equal. And notice that total of frequencies has to be my sample size, which is 39. Please notice there were originally 39 elements here. I broke it into a bunch of groups called classes and total of those non-overlapping classes must be my total for the sample. And this is indeed 39, just like we noticed. So if I didn't get 39, if I had 38, it would mean that I lost one element and well, then I would have to double check everything again. But looks like I got lucky at this time and that feels good, right? So it looks like everything worked. And I produced a frequency distribution for you. That's your first frequency distribution. How about that? Let me scroll back up to the story of section 2.1, uh, 2.2. When you say, Alex, this is already 2.4 or something. Yes, turns out that chapter two is really unusual chapter because what it does, it gives you a story that cannot be broken into different sections. So section 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4, we can talk about at the same time. So it's really one big story. Well, they try to break it into little parts, but it's really the same, same thing. So well, I'm going to back to chapter two, section two, which is actually called frequency distributions. So what I just did, I went to the end of section 2.2, where they have a whole bunch of these little tables. So you can see how they produce those distributions. They actually just gave you those distributions in here. And uh, looks like they very similar to what I have produced for you. Like for example, exercise two has analogous, analogous table. So please notice that if I continue through this section 2.2 exercises at the end of the section, then we have lots of questions such as a 14 that says, look at the appendix B. I don't think this textbook has appendix. So I would say whenever exercise tells you, look at the appendix B or C or whatever, you could just skip this exercise. So you should not worry about it. In, in other words, all you can do here in this particular section is just the questions that don't ask you for any use of those appendices because we don't have access to the appendices. And that's why you could just skip those exercises. So 
you can do just problems on the first page and uh, that be for homework remember i told you well from every section maybe do a couple of exercises like maybe one and three and that should be good enough because uh, otherwise it'll be just too much because again chapter two is one big story so once you hit questions that mention those appendices means that the following ones also will mention the appendices so you don't have to worry about them simply because you don't have those appendices how can you do them right so you just stop at that stage and i think the reason is we didn't really buy the book it's uh, online for free so we just uh, have whatever we were able to get for free but again that's good enough what else can i do with this uh distribution that i produced in here so let me add you a little bit more to this story because once you have produced the distribution then you can work with it a little bit further so here's your distribution you can make a picture of your sample and that's what i started to do here on the left side of the margin so what I had this like X axis and I can put analog of Y axis on the other side. Please notice if I go from 31 to zero, it has to be far to the left, but I don't really care for it. That's why people usually put that little wiggle here. So it means that this is a little bit contracted your X axis because you just care about the range from 31 through 76. So what I'm gonna do is find the largest uh, frequency in my table here in my distribution and looks like there are two of them both of them 15 so what we're going to do is get a bar that has a height of 15 that starts at 31 and that goes all the way to the 42 and this bar will show us the frequency the number of elements in the first group how about that looks like the next frequency is also 15 so the second bar that i put here will be of the same exact height as well right so i happen to have two exactly the same classes so two bars will be of exactly the same height well next one is a little bit lower is eight well eight is like a half right it's pretty much a half of 15 because eight times two is 16 right so approximately a half so i put that number eight here and get a bar twice shorter that corresponds to the next class finally a very last one well there is pretty much no height here because there is only one element right so we have a very little bar at the very end and say okay alex you definitely enjoying yourself so you produce the bunch of bars well i made a picture of our sample that has another special statistical name it's called histogram histogram is what i just produced sometimes people say it's a bar graph and the reason why i produced it is Please look back at this sample. Let me go back to it, find it for you. It's right here. So, bunch of numbers right there. It says ages of different actors. So, you will, let's say, produce some type of uh, presentation and you will say, you know what? Well, here's the ages of the actors. They highlighted here in blue. Well, people look at them and say, well, that's just a bunch of numbers. So what are you talking about? If you, though, tell them that these ages are most popular in a category from 31 through 53, because it looks like those are the highest bars. Everybody will get an intuition and say, yes, and that looks like most of the ages somewhere between 31 and 53, and once it's a little bit higher age. Well, then it's not as popular, I guess, for the Oscar winning. And the uh, very last category has only one 
the representative. So that's the one that's unusual. So let's say if you're trying to sell something to the actors, well, you probably should target category up to 53 years of age and you don't go with 70 years of age because you're not gonna have many customers. So if you go to the, let's say bank to get some business loan and you will give them this bunch of numbers and say, look at these numbers, look at them. So it's like, I'm not gonna target the older category. Well, because, and they will not understand what you are talking about. They'd be very confused with it. But if you give them this nice histogram, well, then they will right away say, yeah, it looks like indeed it makes sense to shoot for the younger because there are more elements in the population with this, so you will definitely get better profits. So there are various ideas that you can get when you present numbers with this graphic, with pictures, rather than just throw these numbers on people. And that's why you wanna present those numbers nicely. And that's the reason why I decided to round this 11 and a quarter. Remember, I didn't wanna use this 11.25 uh, because if I put this 0.25s here in my histogram, it would start to confuse people. You wanna be as precise and as neat as possible because your goal is to bring the message, to show what is going on, not to start confusing people with some decimals, with some other nasty little numbers because then people just lose the point of your story and well, guess what? You're probably not going to get that business loan, right? It's just, okay, we're going to think about it. Let us a few years to think about it. So just go away. So that's definitely not a good idea. So, and that's the reason why advice is make it look nicer. So here's the use of histogram. And uh, when I was scrolling this back and forth, I noticed another nice presentation of numbers, which is called a pie chart. It's like a pizza that is sliced into pieces. I think I saw this also someplace. See, there are various ways to present this data, the sample elements intuitively so people can better feel what is going on. Here's another very popular presentation of data. It's called pie chart. So it's like a pie that is sliced a number of pieces. Well, guess who gets the biggest one, right? Mm -hmm because you will deserve it after you slice it. So to be able to slice this into pieces, I need to get percentages. And the percentages will correspond to so-called relative frequencies. So what I'm gonna do is produce another bar in this little distribution, in this frequency distribution, because those are frequencies that distribute it and I will get so-called relative frequencies, relative. So to get relative frequencies, I need to utilize 39 and divide each of these frequencies by number 39 by the total number of elements in my sample. So this will bring me to decimals that I can actually use to get those percentages to cut my pizza into pieces or pie, whatever you prefer. So it looks like I can just divide these four numbers by 39 by sample size. And I'll go back to my favorite calculator to this Desmos calculator. And let me just do it. So 15 divided by 39. Well, that's somewhere like uh, 0.38, right? So let me again, rounded to nearest percent. So it's about 38%, so approximately 0.38, right? So I just put uh, first two decimals. Same thing will be with the next one because that's the same 15 over 39. So it's another 0.38. So now I'll go with the number eight divided by 39. See, I like this calculator because it shows me entire fraction that I have to calculate. So it is convenient. And I will always utilize this calculator for this class because when we get a little bit more complicated looking calculations to perform, it'd be also very convenient. So I think when I round it, it'd be about 21, right? 0.21, because 
when you have the five here that follows zero, five or bigger means I need to add one, so it'll be like 0 0.21. When I say, Alex, what if I put 0 0.20, like 20 better? Okay, I put 0 0.20 because it's all approximate anyways, right? We see it's not equal. I put this wiggly equal sign, it's approximately equal. I'm not gonna pick on you because of that. In fact, I never pick on my students because I'm always in a good mood. See, you always wanna keep greater in a good mood. So if greater feels good, then greater feels like giving you an excellent grade, like an A. I was in such a good mood last time, I give A to everybody, right? So just keep it up like that. And if you forget something, check your emails. I will remind you, don't worry. Because my goal is to give you the best possible grade. I already told you that, right? I think it'd be fair. So you feel good and that will make me feel good, right? So anyways, 0 0.025, so I will round it to 0 0.03, right? So 0, 0.2, I add one because the five follows that digit. Okay, about 0 0.03. Please notice that if I wanna check this out by adding all these decimals together, I should get about a hundred percent. It's like a one whole thing. And guess what I get when I add these? Eight and eight is 16 and another four is 20. So we'll carry two here. And three is five, another three is eight, another two is 10. So exactly one whole thing or a hundred percent. Well, sometimes it may be a 99%. If you round it down a few times and here I round it down and round it up. So it ended up with pretty much whole thing but sometimes you round down too many numbers and that's how you get a little bit less but it should be pretty much the same as a hundred percent it should not be a hundred and fifty percent that's way way off something would be wrong so about a hundred percent so what i'm gonna do is produce so-called pie chart pie chart i know when i say word pie chart some people get hungry so i'll let you go and enjoy your uh, lunch after that because you will definitely deserve it so pie chart has 0.38 in it for the first class 0.38 if you imagine a half right that'd be 50 so 38 is a little bit less like a quarter is a 0.25 so it's somewhere in between of a half and a quarter so it's some place probably here so I'm trying to do my best in order to approximately get this picture down. And the second class must also be of pretty much same size. So it's another 0.38, so probably somehow like that. So it's kind of symmetric picture on both of these sides. So this might be my classes from 31 through 41, right? And next class will be from 42 through 52. Okay. So... Now, last two classes. I think it's a good idea to put a very last class as a very narrow little slice. So maybe you'll give it to the neighbor, right? And this is the one that I will put like a tiny little slice. I have a neighbor that doesn't like me much because I never give him biggest slices. Maybe I should change the politics. But anyways, so this class, Number three goes from 53 through 63. And then the class number four, uh, it's uh, 64 through 76. Yeah, I just recalled my neighbor. He told me yesterday, whenever he has COVID, he will give me a COVID. After I gave him a little slice, it was really disappointing. So I should be careful, that's for sure. Well, anyways, so four slices are here, and there we go, the pie chart. And that's another represent representation of the sample that we had. So lots of times you probably see this in the business uh, section of newspaper. Um, so they can show you that some slices are bigger, so classes are bigger, and some are just having pretty much nothing like the last one. It's very, very small. So this is a pie chart in here. So I go back to the textbook and we just saw another unusual chart. It's called Pareto chart. Well, we don't really use it because that's uh, 
way too exotic, they say. So it's just like a pie chart, but the bigger slices are, they make them longer. If uh, slice is real narrow, like this guy, for example, it's uh, much narrower, so they make it also shorter. Well, I guess it looks nice if you want to present data, but it's kind of unusual, right? So I think pie chart is more standard. So I guess pie chart and the bar graph, that's or called histogram. That's another topic. And looks like it's uh, actually coming in the next section. And uh, well, we'll talk more, of course, about this section. I know it's just the first week of class, just introduction. So my goal is not to overwhelm you. We'll see some more other stuff next time, like this uh, so-called stem and leaf plot. We'll do it next time. So uh, don't worry about it. For now, I just want to look at section 2.2 and maybe do a couple of little exercises for you and then have you try to do one of them as a little quiz for today. So in the exercise number one, they didn't tell me how many elements I had in the sample. So what is going to be sample size in and remember how I could check out if my table was produced correctly. I simply added all of the frequencies together, right? Added all of the frequencies together. So if I add all of these frequencies, I will know how many elements the sample should contain. So let's see, five and seven is, uh, is gonna be a 12, and another two is 14, 19, 20. So I put zero, carry two, and then another two will be four. So there are 40 elements. How about that? 40 elements in the first sample. How about next exercise? Looks like I'm going to do the whole homework for you today. So you add these elements in. The sample size will be the sum of all of these. So let's just add them. When you say, Alex, I don't want to add them mentally. I just put them in the calculator. That's a perfect idea. Well, so three and one is four and five is nine and eight is 17 and another three is 20. So again, I put zero, carry two. That's another 40. Hmm. Looks like that's their favorite sample size. How about if you do problem number two for a little quiz for today, but please don't hurry. So what does quiz mean? You wanna find the sample size just like I did in the previous two exercises in problem one and three, and then put the answer in the Zoom chat. So you can see here the chat that I shared with you, right? But if you just put the answer in the Zoom chat, it will go to everyone in class. And if God forbid this is a wrong answer, well, people not gonna like it, say that person tricked us, right? So they're not gonna be happy. So you just select Alex, only one person. It's actually, uh, uh, my last name is Alex Nikolaychuk. So N-I-K, whatever. And then you put this uh, answer in a Zoom chat. And that way I will be able to record your answer right now, but please don't hurry. You have plenty of time. So just tell me the sample size for this exercise. Not tell me, just write it. and. Well, I guess that's going to be our quiz for today. So I'm going to stop to record.